Hello, everybody, and welcome back to That Milan Podcast. I'm Martino Pucci, alongside me, Matt Santangelo. We got an episode out a little bit quicker than we usually anticipate in the middle of the week, so we're happy to bring you this episode recording on Tuesday night. Um, please like, subscribe to the channel at That Milan Podcast. Um, you can find us on Twitter at That Milan Pod. Again, on Apple, Spotify. Subscribe, like, and comment on the YouTube channel on uh, Milan's win over Verona, which we will be discussing and who... Uh, or how you think Milan will perform against Roma in the Europa League. So big draw there. Civil war in my family now um, for this. But uh, but yeah, Matt, I mean, the first thing that we need to talk about here is the dominance against Verona. Um, expected, needed, and granted. Uh, what was your overall thoughts on this performance? Because this was just pretty much everything you would have wanted outside of two things, which I'll get to in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, this was a good performance. I think, you know, uh, in the build-up to this in our previous episode, um, I think I predicted 2-0, and I was pretty much saying, you know, we'll play, we'll play better, we'll, play, we'll, can, we'll do a good job, we'll play a good match. Um, but I always felt like, you know, there was, there was going to be moments where Verona were going to find a way to, you know, kind of slip score in. Score a goal. To score, and, you know, they had, they had a couple opportunities in this match. I think 3-1 is... I'm not saying it's generous because I think that Milan could have had more. I think there were a couple other instances. Rafa could have had another goal that he just put wide. Um, three three goals away to a Verona team that look they pretty much gutted this entire team in January. A lot of their key players in Gonge went to Napoli. Um, you know they had Farioni. They had a bunch of guys got Terracciano so signed for Milan. Yeah, yeah, the Terracciano. So I mean I think this was a team that looked like they were kind of punting on the season in January, if I'm being honest. Um, and they have a pretty much an entirely new team here. And they've been playing pretty good football. You can tell in this match that despite it being 3-1 final, there yeah. were moments in this match that, you know, kind of gave me a little bit of a scare and some pause because, you know, at one point it was 2-1. And Verona actually looked like they were going to, you know, potentially – make this thing very tight until the very end. There was a great goal by Nelson that I think his name was Tijani Nelson. There was two, G- two Johnnies on the field at the same time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it was crazy. Was fantastic goal. Yeah. Um, Manion couldn't do anything about that. A great hit. Um, Manion also had another save. I think it was on Ruslov was the winger. Um, I, I, I'm for, The name is escaping me. But um, those two players gave Milan some trouble throughout the match. And look, it was great to see Pulisic get another goal. Scores in four straight. Um, no Okafor got the start um, with him and also Rafael Leao, uh, which was kind of what fans have wanted to see for a while this season, right? Just to see all three. How does Noah look as the number nine? Do we look more and more mobile? Do we look a little bit more dangerous? And I think a lot of those questions were answered in this one. So 3-1, Doteo with a great goal, sticks with it. You yeah. Know, gets the which, we'll, which we'll, which we'll just like really talk about. Because yeah. this is just... I think, and and I might be a little bit dramatic, I might be exaggerating, but I can't imagine another player in the world doing this goal. Like, I just, I can't, I can't think of it. Like, probably Mbappe, like guys like that, right? But just in a left back with that Mm -hmm. sort of pace and control on the touchline was just incredible. It really looked like that was going to go out of play but a couple times, right? That's one of those that you just chalk up to be, oh, this will probably be a corner, or if it's unlucky, deflect off of him for a goal kick. But then you see him end up scoring this, and you're like, yep, that's Teo Hernandez during an afternoon game um, in Serie A where he just keeps on scoring these wonder goals. Um, Again, a really sound match from him. He's had so many goal contributions. I think very underratedly, you know, outside of Pulisic and Leao, he's clearly Milan's third best player this season. And I know Giroud has these sort of, you know, results with his statistics that are reflecting very well upon him. But if we're talking about statistics, I test from minute one to minute 90, the fact that he's played center back for like a month, essentially, uh, I think Teo has been a fantastic for large stretches of this season and shows how invaluable he is to this team. Because there is very few players on this planet that could have this offensive production from the fullback position and specifically on the left side and still put in good defensive shifts. So I think this goal was fantastic. What what have you really taken away from Teo this year? Because I think this is kind of like a different version of him because we saw more versatility than ever. This is the Teo that we've come to know, this type of Teo, right? Where he's bombing forward, he's getting goals, he's getting assists. I mean, he's... I think it was Semper Milan put out a graphic, and I think he's got more goals, assists, goals and assists combined um, 
you know, himself between those yeah, two yeah. categories ahead of Lautaro Martinez and Dusan Vlahovic in this calendar right. year. Right. Um, I think all competitions, a Serie A, whatever the case he's may be, 14. he's putting up numbers that are reminiscent of, you know, his previous seasons where, you know, he's a constant threat to, to do some damage in the final third. And when he's getting in the final third, he's super physical. He wins a lot of fouls. I know people say he, he flops and he bitches and moans. But the fact of the matter is he wins a lot of fouls. He creates a lot of, of a threat going forward. Um, and I, I, I touch on this in the, the previous episodes, you know, as we were kind of getting up until like the final stretch of the season here, you know, you're, if you're getting Rafa in his fine form and you're getting Teo, essentially in my view, peaking right now, as far as what we've seen this entire season, then I think uh, you have to like the prospects of what Milan have going forward to finish the season very strong. I mean, they're in second place right now, three points clear of Juventus who drew on the weekend to Genoa, um, Rafa still, despite not getting maybe the goals that he would like, I know he had the great goal against Slavia Prague and still missing some chances. He looks dangerous. Pulisic, as we mentioned, scored in four straight. He's got 12 goals, eight assists in all competitions this year for himself. So you're getting a bunch of contributions from varying guys up in the attack. And the one thing I do want to point out too is, you know, Giroud and Jovic, they haven't been scoring goals, getting many assists lately. I know they went on this little mini run where like we were getting a lot of production from our standard number nines. Yeah. But I think when you look at, you know, the most recent run of games, it's been strictly, you know, it's been mostly Rafa. Yes, it's been Pulisic, but we've also been getting goal contributions from the midfield. Ruben Loftus-Cheek, how many goals did he have in the Europa League, you know, in the last He's couple of games? He's four so in the four games. Milan are getting yeah. contributions from a lot of different players right now. Um, I think the big boost, this was something I touched on entering the season, Martino, um, is getting contributions from an expanded amount of players, specifically yeah. in the midfield. I think if you look at a lot of the teams that are are dangerous, that do scratch out results, they they get that contribution from at least one midfield player that can get some goals. I think Inter have it with Hakan. Guy takes the penalties. He gets a lot of goals. But you're seeing the breakdown here. Milan are yeah. getting a lot of goals, and they're getting it from a bunch of different players this year. So, and these are just the summer good. signings alone, too. That you're that, that that this is referencing to. Remember the statistic that we always mention: Milan have the most "quote unquote" Joker goals, the most goals from substitutes this season. Yeah. Which just kind of makes everything kind of more frustrating in the sense that they're still so far behind Inter, but they've gotten so many great contributions from their summer market. But their defense and and holding midfield has been atrocious. But it, but you're right. It's it's great to see that and. I want to talk a little bit more about no Okafor. So it kind of goes hand in hand with the Pulisic goal in the four straight games. Mm -hmm. Just a real quick shout out to him. This is his highest ever goal tally in Europe. He has been just a consistently great player this season. Um, four straight goals in, in four consecutive matches. I think just him having the ability to do this on his left foot, um, just tapping that ball in after no Okafor had fantastic pressing. And, and I think really what I want to harp on here with the Noah Okafor impact, and I know this is something you agreed upon too and what you were mentioning and how you wanted to see this Trident up front is what can we do with a forward that could really press for the entire duration that he's playing out there, right? Giroud from time to time, he does a pretty good job at pressing, but he obviously can't keep up with the amount of sprints and, and the amount that like Noah Okafor did right here, right? So for example, on this goal, and you can tell me if you disagree with this, when Noah takes the ball away, right, and he and he just basically bursts ahead up the pitch, mm -hmm. Olivier Giroud gets caught, okay? He can't dribble that quick anymore. He doesn't blow past defenders. You know, they're going to catch up to him. He might win that ball, sure, but he's always going to be looking for that outlet pass. Whereas Noah Okafor could at least carry the ball up the pitch, something that Olivier Giroud isn't capable of anymore. And when Noah does that, he puts a decent shot on goal and Pulisic follows it up with a tap in. Noah Okafor, again, man, just if it wasn't for injuries, this guy has been just as good of a signing as any player this season for the club outside of Pulisic because Pulisic's been uh, really mercurial. At this point, Noah Okafor is showing versatility on the left wing like he did against Empoli, and now he's showing it as the number nine uh, against Verona. What do you make of these types of performances, and do you think this kind of shifts – where Milan look this summer for a potential number nine, because if they're like, well, if we can get these contributions from Noah Okafor as a second or third choice striker, mm -hmm. then it probably makes our options a little bit easier to pick from uh, this coming summer. But once again, this is just Noah Okafor's versatility and then just the consistency of Christian Pulisic. 
Yeah, I was looking up a, a tweet I posted, I think, at the time of us signing Oka 4. And um, I think my, my expectation was, I tweeted, I was like, 12 to 14 goal contributions across all competitions, I think would be pretty solid for Noah yeah. in his first season. I think given the fact that, you know, you didn't really know what type of role he would play, where he would play a little bit on the left, he maybe would play a little bit as a false nine, maybe he would float in behind as like a playmaker type. Um, I, we were kind of curious to see how Pioli would utilize him. Um, now he hasn't quite reached that marker yet. I mean, I think he's, I don't know what his total is for those comp, they're all competitions this year. So, so he's at seven, uh, seven goal contributions in all competitions. He seven goals. I mean, he could still get five. He could still get five the rest of the way between all competitions. I think it's possible. Um, if he, if he's getting more burn and it's he obvious. He hasn't even that, played 800 minutes. I mean, he's not right. He's been banged up. He's been coming a lot of times off the bench and getting goals and making an impact. So I think if Pioli is leaning in the direction of playing Okafor based off what he saw on the weekend as a number nine and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going I'm going to be going with the hot hand. He's done it this year, Pioli, and I'll, I'll, I will give him credit for this. Maybe it took him yes. a little bit longer to, 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 to realize this. But, you know, at one point he, he gave Jovic a shot. Jovic wasn't ready. Everyone was saying Jovic out. Then Giroud, um, you know, he had the, he's had the goal contributions this year. But then late last year, early this year, Jovic was on fire. He was scoring goals. Yep. You know, Pioli was giving him that that trust and that opportunity to play more regularly, and he was repaying that. And then you've seen recently, you know, I know Jovic was suspended for a couple games, but then yep. you've seen a match like this against Verona where Noah Okafor is able to stretch the opposition. He's able to get in behind. He's able to press. He's able to do a lot of things off the ball that open up space and that at least keep the defense honest. And I think with what we saw on the weekend, I think it's – it's a case that maybe Pioli is going to rock with a, a more versatile, a little bit more athletic, a little bit more peppy is maybe the word to put it, front three that can get after the defense and put guys forward and put them on the back foot. If he does that, then I think Okafor will have a lot more goals and assists coming his way. I mean, the 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 goal for Pulisic is basically an assist at that point because he did a heavy lifting on the run, but he didn't get the goal contribution there. Um, so I think no Okafor's come on – quite well. Uh, I'm happy with him year one for that investment of what, 11 to 12, 13 million. I think it was like 13 million. 13 in million for a young player. If he stays healthy, I think there's no doubt in my mind he's he's hitting 12 to 15 goal contributions this year. But, you know, it, uh, Milan are getting him back in pretty good form for the rest of the season. And this is what Milan won heading into that crucial tie against Roma, which we'll talk about in the Europa League. Yeah, and again, um, check out the video we did uh, back in the summer when Noah Okafor signed for Milan. We had Ahmed Badir on. Um, he was talking about how much he loved the signing. It was really hard to find uh, people against this signing, giving his age, his versatility, um, his experience in the Champions League, and obviously the fee being very low uh, relative to a lot of other players. But again, shout out to Pulisic. Uh, just unbelievable. And how about the guy that they also have in Pulisic's position? Somebody that we have been the three new attackers the drum. Signed, make an impact. I mean, listen, Chukweze was making an impact in Europe, doing what he could. Basically, was the reason that Milan got into Europa League was because of his goal against Newcastle and that mm. and that winner there. And even shout out to Pulisic as well. The right side is a breath of fresh air. I know Chukweze's had a rough go of it. He's missed some time due to injury. He obviously isn't. And he even commented on this after the game. And he's saying the same exact things that we are saying to some of our yeah. listeners and followers, where it's like, hey, listen, I want to play. I know I can contribute. But at the end of the day, I can't get mad at Stefano Pioli for not benching Pulisic. Like, why would he bench Pulisic if he's playing so well? If Pulisic's form dropped off, then Pioli is obviously going to sit him and rest him. Mm -hmm. But when Chukweze got more of an opportunity here, Matt, this is a banger. One of the best goals of the year for Milan. I mean, this volley from basically outside the box was just fantastic. And, and to his point, it gives him confidence. And this mm -hmm. is exactly what he needed to see. Um, I was very happy for him. I think a lot of fans were because they know how rough of a first year it's been. And this is kind of something that you were talking about. Yeah, there's been a lot of signings over the summer, but there is a chance that some of these guys might have a flop in the first season. Chukweze kind of looking like that. I think he's rebounded decently enough. You would have wished he'd done more, but I think that's also reflective of how well Pulisic has played. And that's a good problem to have, right? If you're Milan, you want these problems. You don't want it like, eh, well, you know, Neither guy is really working out that well, and we don't know who to play a la Salamakers and Macias from time to time, right? Mm -hmm. um, you just know that the floor for these players is way higher than the ceiling of the players of the past. 
Um, again, Chukweze getting this goal was just fantastic. You can see how happy Rafael Leal was for him as well. Any other further comments on this before we kind of go to some of the negatives of the match? This is what we wanted. This is what we hoped for, right? I think there was a lot of chatter about you know, Chukweze. You know, we we spent a, we spent more on Chukweze than we did on Pulisic, if I'm correct. That fee was uh, yeah, I think I think Chukweze's deal will go to be more when certain incentives have missed. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this was a pretty expensive move by all accounts, and the fact that you know look, we have I think what three goals and an assist in all competitions for Chukweze, some performances that. Yes, he's come off the bench, so it's difficult to kind of get stuck in and 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 deliver something of importance. But I think it's really more so a focus on how does he finish the season, right? Because if he finishes the season strong and he's getting goals and he's coming off the bench, maybe he has a little bit of a no no Okafor vibe about him, where you know he's playing 15, 20 minutes and he's helping Milan get wins and he's helping Milan get results and he he finishes the season strong. Now it's a conversation of saying, hey, look. We got Noah playing well off the back of the uh, off the back of last season. We have Rafa playing well. He's our he's our catalyst going forward. Pulisic had a career highs so basically across the board, and you yeah. have Chukweze who had a rough go to start things, but now he's also playing well. So now you have numbers, and we haven't even talked about who potentially could be the starting number nine next year. So yeah. I think that's to your point a good problem to have, and the fact that we're able to have this discussion about. You know, oh, can no should no Okafor be starting, or can he play on the left? Can he, we didn't we weren't able to have this and entertain this discussion last year because Correct. I think it was pretty obvious who the starting front three was going to be. You know, mm -hmm. aside from it, whether 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 it was going to be Macias or Salamakers, but at that point you're kind of choosing pick your pick your poison because one yeah. player is going to be uh, a guy that does a lot off the ball, and the other guy is going to be maybe he pulls out a goal like he did against Atletico Madrid and talking Junior Macias, right? So I think that Milan have some options here. Now, we talked about this at the beginning of the season, right? Like, it's great that Milan brought in Chukweze, Okafor, Pulisic, and it was like Pioli's never had this option. He's never had the luxury of choices right. to make in the attack, and there's going to be pressure on him to put these players in positions to succeed. He's done it with Pulisic. Everyone was questioning whether or not he could be a right winger out and out for an entire season and deliver the results. He has no Okafor. More or less, we kind of understood what his usage would be. Um, left side when Rafa was you know, on the bench or, or getting a breather. And then also a player that can play as a number nine. So we've started to see that. But Chukweze is, we, we've seen it in spurts. And I'm hoping that this is a sign of things to come. That's, that's, a, that's a fantastic goal. And you know, for him to get his first in Serie A in a match like this, you know, which again, as I mentioned, Martino, the game was 2-1. So for him to get a fine goal like this, to help kind of put things at ease and put the game to bed. I think this has to be great for his confidence. And I'm hoping that we get a little stretch of, of burn from Chukweze. Um, and I think it makes it a little bit more easy for Pioli because he can say, hey, you know what? I want to play Pulisic in the Europa League. But if it's a match in, in, in the league that I need to have to help cement top two or top four, you know what? I can feel confident putting Chukweze out there knowing that he's going to deliver and he's going to bring something good to the table. So a big ups to him. I'm definitely happy with, uh, with the goal he scored and the impact he was able to make. Yeah, four goal contributions and a little less than 900 minutes. So, I mean, there's there's been reasons for it. Um, but again, just nice to see that goal go in the back of the net. And Pioli's reaction, I think, body language FC was kind of overreacting to it. I think it was. Yeah, I saw sensible. people thinking, like, why was is it, he mad? I think it was. No, he like was a, he was clearly relieved, I think. he was. Yeah. I think he was happy for him. I think that right. stress yeah. that you kind of saw was like, oh, fi like, finally, like, holy shit. Like, we, right. we yeah. finally got this guy going. Like, that's yeah. the goal. That kind of goal just, like, relieves, like, all sense of emotion. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's a banger. There's a no doubt about it. It's a fantastic goal. It was almost it's like that. Sort of uh, happy tapping. That El Shadawi goal, like years ago, where he was struggling, and then he like literally broke down in tears because he was like, "I needed this one badly. Like, I truly <laughs> yeah. needed this goal." And it was, I it was like didn't goal cry, but like you could see me. like Rafa going up to him, like hugging him, pulling him up in the air. Yeah. Like they all knew how kind of how much it meant for him to get yeah. that off his back and to get his first goal in the league. So yeah, like I think it's a testament to you know the 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 kind of togetherness and the cohesiveness of this attack because you see like. There's vibes with Rafa and Noah that like everyone's like even on the goal, right? When Pulisic scored, he turned right over and went right to Noah. And he's like, that's you. Like, that's yep, that's all yep. you. Like, Correct. so there is that sort of synergy and that cohesion between these guys. And it's 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 great to see. Yeah, uh, definitely. Unfortunate thing to see. Yeah.
our guy Pierre Kalulu comes back after a long injury absence. Um, look fit and good in the minutes that he was playing in. Um, a little shaky at times during this one. Um, he's out for six weeks minimum uh, with a sprained MCL. There's some fortunate news that they're in the international break right now. There's a little bit more time, but you're really kind of looking at his return coming in May, um, especially with match fitness, with the way some of these defenders are playing right now. Really hard to see Pierre Kalulu kind of get more minutes the rest of the way here. It honestly just feels like a lost season for him where he could have definitely built off of something. Um, some people are saying that they think this is the last that they'll see of him at this club. I, 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 I disagree because of the sense of that no one is going to pay the amount that Milan will probably ask for, and you're probably selling him at his lowest value, which doesn't make much sense. I think there's more of a player in here, and there needs to be more confidence. Again, don't forget they did renew his contract just last year. This isn't a player that they look like they'll be getting to get rid of, but again, never say never with certain prices. But the fact is Kalulu's out for an extended period of time basically puts the nail in the coffin in the season for him. Um, what do you make of this? I, I think this is just more frustrating than anything. I think he's had the most frustrating season out of any of our players, probably besides Mike Magnan, um, I would say, because this is just this is just brutal, man, because they were they were looking for him to contribute down the stretch here. I think he would have been much needed. It's disappointing. Um, I think, you know, look, we, we saw the heights that he performed at down the stretch in this scoot that the winning season, him and Vicayo were nails. They were defensive stalwarts by all accounts. They could not be scored on. And, you know, you looked at the future of that tandem and also the back line and you're like, all right, like Milan really has something here. They found an absolute gem in Kalulu. Um, still very young. You know, he showed some versatility to play, you know, as a right back. He's very mm -hmm. athletic, strong, playing as a central defender, really formed a good relationship with, with Tamori. And then really since then, he's been, you know, kind of a little shaky. Um, and let's be yeah. honest, most of our defenders have been. I mean, you know, Teo has been through his spells where he's looked like a shell of himself, not making the same runs forward, defensively mm. not the same, just not making the same impact. And I think that's kind of a consistency problem across the board with the defense. Obviously, Teo is probably our, our top guy back there, and you can put Fikai right next to him. But I think, you know, the, the jury's still out on what the heights and, and, and the expectations are with you right. guys like Malik Chow and Kalulu. So I think that it's pretty kind of open, uh, open ended as to what we can expect going forward from them. I mean, I think, you know, Pierre Kalulu, I think there was an interview that came out this week or the previous week. I think Sempre put up their translation um, and you might be able to find it quicker than I can. But sure. um, there was talks about the psychological toll this all took on him, you know, him being sidelined for such a long time, not being able to play. And when you're a young player and you have the, you know, the experience and success that he had such such early in his career at Milan. I mean, this guy came off the pit, came on to make his debut and you know, off the bench. It was like, okay, here's your debut. We have an injury. Go out there and play. And he really hit the ground running and became a really reliable player for us. And I think people saw that he was going to be a figurehead for our defense for, for years to come. And he's, I think he still can be. He's still very, very much young. But I think when you look at the way this season was shaping up and all the injuries that we faced to the back line, you were hoping mm -hmm. that, you know, Kalulu would be able to take that step forward in like a baptism by fire, if you will, that we had Fikayo sideline for such a long time that, you know, maybe Kalulu would come on strong and be like the guy that could kind of like usher, you know, a Simic and some of these other guys along and be able to take on that responsibility of being the key guy mm -hmm. in the back when, you know, those other guys were out. But I think he's played over what, a hundred plus minutes, all competitions, if that. So I think it's, again, to your point, a lost season for him. Um, I think that the, the plan, in my view, um, obviously, is to take it easy on him. I think that, look, if you have Fikayo, um, Malik Chow, who's looked shaky, Gabia, who's looked very sturdy since we came back in January, Simon Kayer, and, of course, your fifth would be Simic. Um, I think that's enough to see us through the end of the season. Um, yeah. I think if there's an opportunity to see Kalulu play maybe in the last one or two games, you know, let's say we already clinched second or like we have nothing to play for and you right. can give Kalulu a little bit of burn and like a stress-free, you know, low intensity game. I think you can definitely do it. But I think right now it's about preservation. It's about not shattering the guy's, his mental. And I think, you know, that's what could be really difficult for younger players, you know, when their sideline as long as they are, because, 
it's their competitors. You know, Kalu is a young youngster who has success here, and he wants to make an impact, and he wants to repay that faith that you know the club gave him when they gave him that new deal that you mentioned. So, yeah. um, it, it, it's it's a it's it's a bummer for sure, and I'm uh, I'm hoping that he comes back very soon and we can see him on the pitch again. Yeah, he turns 24 in June. Um, I don't think this is a player that they'll give up on. Like the the articles have mentioned with Sempre Milan and coming out of Italy about, you know, if the right offer arrives. That's silly. You want to know why, guys? Because you can say that with any player. Yeah. Hey, if the right offer arrives for uh, Rafael Leal for $300 million, I think Milan are going to do it. I think that oh, Milan, yeah, no, I, I, I truly think that the, 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 the really the only opportunity, I think if, look, if Milan were to get another defender, I would assume one of those three have to go, or maybe it's, I don't see. I how mean, he, I think I think when Simone Kier goes and you loan out a Simich, then, then you can I, get I someone. But realistically speaking, I don't think you're going to get someone in the in the in the mold of like a thirty to forty million defender. I think it's going to be someone that's in that like that fifteen million bracket. Like if they're going to go out there and try to get some value, but I just don't see them getting another defender unless they sell one of these three. And I think that would be. I kind of don't agree his, just his because be. they were they were kind of really interested in Buongiorno outside of like the ridiculous fee that, yeah. that uh, Cairo wanted, right? Like the interest was there. They were willing to go to a pretty high number. Like they is were willing it, to is go it to, possible? They were willing to go to 40 if they could loan Simic there and send Colombo on a sale. So I think they're still looking for possible. that left-footed center back. I'm, I'm not really sure what it means for Kalulu. I'm not saying Kalulu is staying or going. I think it's very possible like he could be sold, but I kind of just don't see it because I don't think the right offer that they would accept is going to come along after this season. It's just, this is the typical, like if you're another club, oh, let's go in and buy low on a talent that's just 24 years of age, that has had experience, that has proven he could win a Scudetto for a team, even if it was for a shorter period of time. The talent is there, and people know it, and I think Milan know it, so they're probably not going to jump on it. That's just my guess. Yeah. Um, anyways, we drew Roma in Europa League. Uh, so again, once again, uh, a second straight year in Europe, Milan are facing an Italian team in the quarterfinals. This time, it's Roma. Roma have been playing far better um, under Daniele De Rossi. Um, listen, they were kind of shaky in that match against Fiorentina. They probably should have lost it, but they were lucky to come away with a tie. I would also say they played well enough against Inter, considering the talent gap and how good Inter is in general. They showed a lot of fight and promise, whereas they've been pretty damn awful against Milan the past half decade or so, where Milan hasn't really lost to them. I don't particularly think that they're going to be putting all their resources into beating Milan in this. I actually think they're more focused on Serie A because they see light at the end of the tunnel with Joshua Xerxes' injury and just their overall form in Serie A. And their best chance to get back into the Champions League next year, let's be honest here, with the amount of quality teams left in Europa League, is through yeah. Serie A. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying that this is going to be a cakewalk for Milan. I don't think that whatsoever. Um, I do think Milan are the better side. I do think they should advance. Um, but Roma are going to give them a fight. But going in the Olympico in Europe is going to be very tough. Um, I, I think this is going to be very exciting. I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to talking to Wayne Gerard for this one. Again, mm -hmm. our good friend. Um, I'm very excited to just watch with my family and see their reactions to this. Um, they weren't very happy with this, but they're just happy that Mourinho's gone from all the sense that I'm, every time I talk to my uncle and my no no, they just don't care. And they're very happy that... Uh, that a Romanista like uh, uh, De, uh, De Rossi is in there. So again, pretty difficult. We'll see. These games are on April 11th and April 18th, respectively. I think the first leg is at San Siro, which I always hate first legs at home, uh, second legs away. Uh, this has been the constant theme for Milan. Uh, let's face it. This is something that they need to pull off. Uh, the winner is most likely going to be facing Bayern Leverkusen, who have yet to lose a game miraculous comeback against Karabag, regardless if they were up a man. Your initial thoughts on the draw against Roma. Um, this is this is fun. It's just fun. This is what you want to see. It is fun. It's uh, There's a lot of, obviously, the familiarity of it. I think, um, you know, we've had recent years, of course, we've had really good success against Roma. I mean, we've had their number, let's be honest. And there was a couple matches, you know, I know the game last year, um, or the two games last year, the Salamakers got like a late goal. We got a draw in that match. 
we were absolutely reeling. And then, of course, we were up 2-0 to Roma, and we squandered that with the two headed goals um, at the beginning of that downfall in 2023. So, I mean, I think generally speaking, we've, you know, we they, they still do have some moments where they do play us a little bit tight. I think yeah. under De Rossi, they're going to have that sort of mentality where, you know, they're kind of going to buy into his philosophy, his way of doing things. Now, I know people have been looking down on, you know, the opponents they've played and, you know, some of the performances being like, oh, Dybala's playing great, or Pellegrini's playing great, and, you know, but then you, people are saying, well, look who they've played, you know. But I think ultimately... All you can play is the teams in front of you. You know, Correct. people haven't didn't say anything about Inter bullying the teams on their way to the title this year, pretty much, right? So I think um, I say pretty much because it's not fully done. It's not clinched, but it's as good as clinched in my eyes. Um, it, it would be the greatest comeback of all. It would, time. Yeah, it would, it would be <laughs> catastrophic for Inter, and it'd be delightful for us, right? I, um, I just want to like quickly kind of go through the comparison of schedule because I know you talked about the focuses between Serie A and Europa League. So Milan, um, obviously coming out of the international break, they got Fiorentina, they got Lecce, and then April 11th, that Thursday, they do play Roma at home, followed by Sassuolo. Then they play the return leg um, um, against Roma. Then they got Inter, Juve, and Genoa. That's not easy. Now, that's kind of like the last little stretch for Milan. That's difficult because beyond that, it's Cagliari, Torino, Salernitana, and then that's the season. So this is the this is a little stretch run there. This is the, this is the final lap for Milan, really. Yeah. If they're able to get through this this little cluster of games and they, they can right. get some health, they can get guys playing in, in great form like they are now. I think Milan will really and truly like where they're at at the end of the season. I think for Roma, however, they have a lot more to play. They're on Stanley outside looking in at top four. And real quick, what their their schedule is: they have Lecce coming out of the break, but then they have the uh, Roman derby against Lazio. They have us. Udinese, who's still fighting to, you know, and always annoying, life, yeah. right? Then you have us again. Then you have Bologna. Then you got Napoli. Then you have Juve. Then you have Atalanta. That's a hard, that's a really freaking hard schedule. So I'm leaving out, like, I'm looking at this for the first time for those watching on uh, YouTube. And I'm like stunned that that's their schedule. Like, they have such I, a battle. Yeah, yeah. But, but the point, that's the point I was trying to make earlier is that they played a lot of easier teams. And now it's it's backloaded where they're really going to have to earn that top four spot. So this is where that conversation for De Rossi has to come into play. Like, how are we going to exhaust these resources? Is our pathway to top to, to the Champions League and Bove just Serie got hurt. Through Europa League? It's pretty clear to me it's through through Serie A because Juventus are free falling. Napoli are Napoli this year. Aside from Milan and Inter, like it feels like those spots are really truly up for grabs for a team that can get hot. And right now, De Rossi has this Roma team playing pretty, pretty well. So I, I like where Milan is coming into this draw. Yeah, and even Atalanta slipped up a little bit. Napoli yeah. really seemed like they can't get off the ground running. Again, Lazio Roma is always going to be difficult. The higher Vigor Tudor might be something yeah. that could change there. You know, like get a little coaching lift like Roma did with De Rossi. Um, you're right. It's going to be difficult. And again, one thing we kind of didn't mention was Milan have been playing fantastic at home in the first legs yeah. of, of these competitions. Milan get out to multiple goal leads. Say it's like three to one or something like that. Yeah. De Rossi is going to have to start thinking of things. Um, what's the priority? Who to start when, when he's rotating? Um, Bove just got injured with the U21s. Hopefully it's nothing serious. You also serious. have to look at Dybala. But the he's fact a, of the yeah. matter is, yeah, yeah. Dybala's but, yeah. playing Totti's well. Are, Totti's already saying like, yeah, great player, but how often does he play? Right, like I, yeah. I think that that's kind of another thing too, right? Because I think you know he's been great when he's been on the field. We all know that he's such a difference maker um, for Roma and has been for years for Juventus. But I think now De Rossi's in that position where he's saying, "Lay, look, like I can't run out there realistically, Dybala for eighty to ninety both these matches. I have to find a way to navigate the rest of the season because I truly need Dybala healthy for the remainder of these matches. So, is is it a case of load management for him? And is that that obviously works into the benefit of Milan because Dybala is he's his numbers have been actually like quite good and on par." With yeah. some of his better Juventus years. I mean, if you look at it, the goal contributions, I know he takes the penalties, but the point still stands, he's converting them. So this guy is at the very heart of what Roma looked to do in that attack. I know Pellegrini's been great as well, oh, but so I think good. that De Rossi good has to really truly, when you have a player of that ilk, that caliber, and that uh, importance, hmm. he is going to really have to, um, you kind of 
navigate the season and ultimately put Dybala in positions where he's not, you know, he's not vulnerable. Yeah. Um, it, it's really just managing Dybala and hope he doesn't get hurt. Lukaku, I'm not calling him injury prone, but he's not as healthy and as fit as he used to be in yeah. that first go around with Inter. Um, just not the same player. I, I think it ultimately comes down to priorities as it usually does. And Roma's going to have a harder time rotating with that schedule than Milan will with theirs. And the, um, and the depth is, it's inc incomparable. It's Milan have infinitely better depth than Roma do. Um, I think this will go in Milan's favor. We'll see what happens after that semifinal and final are only going to get harder. Um, but again, I'm excited for this. I wish Roma the best of luck, uh, not only with top four, but also against Milan in this um, tie here. But I think Milan ultimately end up advancing. Again, guys, we really appreciate all the support constantly from live streams to the videos we do with Tom Bogert and some of our other guests and obviously the podcast that we have right here. Again, that Milan podcast everywhere, Apple, Spotify, right here on the YouTube channel. Please like, comment, subscribe. Shout out to all of our friends on Reddit as well. Mm -hmm. Shout out to our friends on Milan Weekly Podcast. Um, coast to coast with Fabio and Gio, uh, Kush, Kush has done such a great job with all yeah. of his work. He's really growing immensely and couldn't happen to a better person as well. Shout out to, um, Semper Milan, by the way, on their 300th episode. It's great to work with those guys. They've done such stellar work over the years and they're only going to have hundreds of more episodes over time. Um, and if I'm forgetting anyone else, I truly, Oh, old hard Rosonero and our guys, uh, the Calcio guys. So seriously, we appreciate all the help. It's been a great community. We love doing these videos and podcasts. Um, I'm sure, Matt, will, you could feel the same here. Just uh, go ahead. I have your stuff on the ticker on the bottom. Just go ahead and uh, tell us if you have some more stuff uh, that you're interested in. Um, nothing at the moment. Uh, work's been a pain. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, try and kind of find time to put out some content and engage with you guys. Hopefully some stuff coming along the way. But anything I'm working on. Um, any podcast appearances, radio appearances, um, all that information will be found on Twitter at Matt underscore Santangelo. Of course, follow my brother and I on AC Milan Bros. We're, I think, at 19.5. It'd be awesome Ooh. if you could get the 20K coming at the end of the season. That'd be really awesome. Um, and also, just a quick little heads up. I don't know if you guys seen their announcement. Milan is coming to the U.S. this summer. We didn't talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, the news yeah. just came out today, time of recording. I think the tickets go on sale as a pre-sale on the 25th of March. Mm. 27th is for the general public. Milan will be playing um, uh, at Yankee Stadium against Manchester City. Actually, a massive game. Um, mm. I have, from a from a you know standpoint of the fact that you know there's the Yankees connection, of course, between these two clubs and NYCFC yep. as well. So I think um, I'm going to be there. I, I don't know what my type of access is going to be. I might try to get some press passes. Who knows? Um, but yeah, that's just a quick little little tidbit for you guys. So if you guys are planning on um, making the trek to the U S for our you know, listeners and viewers outside July of July 31st in Chicago as well. Yeah. Chicago. Oh and then I think we're playing um, at Maryland as well. So yeah. um, some, some, hey, Milan's coming to the States. It's always a good time. So um, go check that out and maybe grab some tickets if you're, uh, if you're available. Yeah. Unfortunately I cannot go. I found out just about an hour ago, I realized um, there's a conflict of schedule with my work. So unfortunately, I won't be able to make any of the games. Uh, sad face. Can't get out of what I have to do. Um, that's unfortunate. But um, yeah, seriously, go. It's a great experience. I've seen Milan and Real Madrid there. I've gone to see... And the Milan clubs too. I mean, Yeah, the Milan clubs. Milan, awesome yeah, shout out Milan Club New York City. Do a great job. Our friends at Milan Club Chicago. Shout out Dimo, who's a friend of the podcast and Nico Develis as well. He, he came on the Milan reports podcast that we did a few years back. Um, great people go and support them. Chicago does great work. I'm not too sure about Maryland. It's more of DC. So shout out to tour Grude. Um, but yeah, um, at Martino Pucci on Twitter, Instagram, Semper Milan, you could find some of the videos and some of the clips that we post from the podcast on here. Once again, we appreciate all the support on audio and video platforms. And again, all of our followers on Twitter that have, uh, seemingly ca come on over here and supported us. We appreciate you guys so much. We've been doing this work for a very long time. We're happy to start seeing uh, great benefits of it. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, take care, guys.